What's going on, guys? It's Brian with Submans Comics, and this is the Bolo Show, where we are recapping the week's hottest comic book releases. We're going to cover first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and have a long-term play for you at the end. With me, as always, is my co-host, Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. What's going on, buddy? Oh, just got done watching that premiere of the Hot and Cold Show. Of course, this is Wednesday night, and we are recording the Bolo Show right here. Ready to talk new comic book day releases. Tons of releases this week, Brian. This is one of the best slates of new comics I've seen in a long time. So this is going to be an action-packed episode. Right. I'm super excited about this week. Weekly picks. Full honesty, I had to cut some of the picks out because it started running too long. And I felt bad about that. But it was a huge... It was like Christmas in the comic book store this week. I actually had pre-order books, but I actually spent a lot in the comic book store picking up extra copies of books that I wanted. Wow. Looks like there were some books that hard to find and then some that were just great. I haven't had a chance to read half of them, of course, because of we had the hot and cold show last night and we're immediately, like you just said, we are recording the Bolo show. This is recorded Wednesday night. So if you're watching and you're in the live chat, just want to let you know this is pre-recorded, but... As always with this show, we do have a sponsor, and that is Nick Dortman at Slabbed Heroes. Make sure you check out SlabbedHeroes.com. Guaranteed nine eights at a great price, great shipping, and raw comics as well. As announced for the weekly picks video and a new sponsor to the channel in general, we also have Frankie's Comics. So make sure you check out FrankieScomics.com. And we have a special 10% discount for Patreon members to Frankie's Comics as well, right, Jack? Right, just another reason to sign up for the Simpleman's Comics Patreon. We're already talking about exclusive content, access to Brian and I, as well as our amazing community, and those Bolo mystery boxes filled with heat. We're talking back issue Bolos, we're talking new releases from this Bolo list, and now filled with those Frankie's Comics exclusive variants. Right, so huge thanks to uh, Frankie's for sponsoring the channel and the weekly picks video which is now brought to you by frankie's comics so we are super excited to partner with frankie's on that but before we get into this week's bolo list we're going to recap a couple books from last week right jack absolutely so coming up on the rewind for last week the first issue we're going to talk about is the one everyone was talking about and we're talking about batman 77 everyone was boo-hooing these books were taken off like gangbusters they are still selling very well we had our own little rant about the book in general, but no denying, this was a hot release last week, right? Yeah, definitely a hot release. Um, of course, no spoiler alerts or whatever, but, you know, it's a death of Alfred, obviously. Um, but, you know, again, we talked about it last week. Is it a death? We don't know. How will this hold up? It's comics after all. What is the importance of the death? Um, you know, that remains to be seen. And um, I think even a bigger long-term play, as we mentioned on the Hot and Cold show, is the Gotham Girl continued appearance as, like, Thomas Wayne's sidekick. But, yeah, like you mentioned, this book is still selling. It has dropped a few dollars from where we were talking about it last week. Last week we were talking about it, like, $25. It's around, you know, that $15 range now. But I think it may drop even more because... Getting to the point where people are starting to get their Midtown orders in, their TFAW orders in, their My Comic Shop orders in. And it's important to note that that's why if you pick these types of books up at your LCS, flip them quick. Because you want to beat those online orders to market. Um, it, you're always going to get a higher price. This is just typical. It's not, it's not even specific to this book. This is just what happens in these situations. Right. Then another book's on the recap for last week. We are going to talk about Powers of X number three. Yeah, and if you read the Bolo list, apparently uh, I thought Powers of X number three came out today, but I, you know that's just mixing my X books up. But um, yeah, you know all of these uh, House of X, Powers of X books they seem to be hitting that fifteen dollar plateau, Brian. That seems to be the magical price on the secondary market. We speculated when number two came out that that was kind of like pre FOC um, of when issue number one came out. So we thought maybe by the time issue number three came out, stores would be caught up to this. But it seems like, nope, that's not the case. Um, you know, they still was a short e of supply of um, this issue, and we're seeing that $15 price tag. Now, again, this is another instance where we're getting some people commenting on various social media platforms arguing, well, my LCS has a ton of them. I hear you, but what makes books spike is 
are they regional? Is it just your LCS that has a ton of them? Or are these accessible to the masses? And the fact of the matter is they're not accessible to the masses. Most people are not able to get their hands on, on these books on a weekly basis. And, uh, you know, the average LCS orders far less than what some of these larger LCSs order. So if you're blessed enough to be able to find these at your LCS, do not assume that they are cold. They're actually good buys and you can make some money on them. You're right. The real question is, if your LCS has a bunch of them, why aren't you flipping them? <laughs> That's the big thing. Whether we're talking once in future first prints, whether we're talking any of these house or powers of X books, um, anytime that you're able to pick up books that are selling for twelve, fifteen dollars in the secondary market, you can grab them for cover price. Yep. That's what you should be doing. Right. And what I would do is I'd pick up a couple of them and sell them in sets of three rather than just yes. selling 10, 10, 12 bucks a piece. But that's just me. Save on that shipping. Yep. So that's a smart move, a little process for you. So, And that's going to be the rewind or the recap for the bullet list from last week. So we're going to bring up this, this week's list. As always, we use this time to talk about this. this is your first time here. What's the bolo list? It is the be on the lookout list where we cover first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and then a long-term play by Jack. Jack does create this list. He gets it out usually late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning. So it's a snapshot in time. We realize things change. New cycle hits early on release day. And a lot of comments come in saying, what about this book? But the list is already created and it's already been published. So with that being said, Jack, this is a big list this week. It is, man. It was a huge list. You mentioned you had to cut some stuff from the weekly picks. And I, I really had a hard time putting this list together because there were just so many books that people were talking about. I still feel like there were some books that ended up getting almost left out. Um, I mentioned to you before recording the Runaways. Big, big event happened in the Runaways where we got to see Doc Justice and the J Team, that big announcement from Marvel. We still don't know who Doc Justice is, but the J Team is the Runaways. It seems like it's a graduated name for the team. So, you know, and that's just one. That's just one uh, um, book that we that we didn't get a chance to highlight on the list um, that's probably a nice spec book. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things. That you can only talk about so many books. And I could barely fit this amount of books in the graphics. That's size six font, guys. I was, gonna, I was about to say, what kind of, what size font are you using there? But, yeah. Size six, which is just barely visible. Right. So, without further ado, we're going to get right into it. We're going to start with... The first appearances of the week. And first off the list, we have Red Hood number 37. Now, this had, what, four first appearances in it? Four first appearances. So you're talking about a $4 book with four first appearances. You're looking at a dollar of first appearance. You really can't argue bang for your buck with that one. Um, now, I will say this is one of those kind of like late-breaking um, popular spec books. There was a lot of talk about this one around Friday. Um, we started to see um, Mighty Mel V YouTube channel. There was a lot of talk about this book, uh, you know. And, and again, I think some. It, I don't think it's a coincidence that this book was heavily talked about on that show, and then sold out at Midtown pretty much right afterwards. At the same point, I can't argue the spec on this. You're talking about four characters, like I said, four dollars. Red Hood and the Outlaws is not a highly printed book, so at that point, you know, if any of these characters pop off. You're going to get a good opportunity to make some money. So I do like the speculation play from that angle. You're looking at the first appearance of Cloud9, DNA, uh, Babe in Arms, and Devour. So with you know, with that, like I said, you got four shots at hitting it big. Now, will they hit it big? There's a lot of DC first appearances that I think people don't realize kind of come and go. So um, it all depends on what the long-term plan is with those characters. We will see. The uh, designs that they put out um, on Twitter, uh, they were pretty cool. Some of the characters, I think, are cool. Some of them, not so much. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. Right. Could we possibly have a new DC Presents 26-type book here with a bunch of first appearances in that book, including Cyborg? Right. I don't. I don't know. You're, you may be making a leap there with that DC Presents <laughs> 26. I think that's one of my favorite. Still to this day, I think that's one of my favorite back issue spec plays. Um, I still think that book is undervalued. But yeah, um, best case scenario, sure, that's what you could be looking at here for sure. Right. You never know. I mean, when that book came out, people were probably well. I won't say think of the same thing because it doesn't seem like people were collecting for spec, but not the way 
people collect for spec today. Right, right. And that was a preview. you got to remember, that's a preview of the yeah. Teen Titans, which yeah. the Teen Titans were still an important entity. Yeah. The real question about these characters is where do they fit in? They're going to be, I guess, outlaws. Yeah. Um, and the outlaws as a team has never been say anything of note as of yet but red hood is popular we just talked about red hood and jason todd on the hot and cold show shout out to catran figures who who came in with that selection um i definitely agree so we'll have to wait and see um anything's possible and i the bottom line is again four dollars four first appearances you can't beat that so these are sold out most places but if like we said with the regionality of comics if you're able to find these at your lcs i would grab it right so we're moving to the next book on the first appearance list this week, and we're going to talk about Buffy vs. the Chosen Ones, number one, right? Right. Now, again, you, this is pretty cool, but there is multiple Boom Studios releases on this list this week, and two come from the Buffyverse. Um, this was the first time, you know, we've seen some, some Buffy discussion going down recently. There's some momentum behind this. And it's funny because we first started talking um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and um, Angel and these releases. It, it, it felt like we were kind of the only ones talking about it. Uh, you know, we obviously we had Arun Singh, the VP of marketing from Boom Studios on the channel. But, you know, now it's really picked up. We're seeing more and more people talking about it. This is this book is called The to Chosen Ones. It is the first appearance of The Chosen Ones. The Chosen Ones are some, like, old school ancient um vampire hunters similar to buffy um and it seems i mean we're coming right before hellmouth we're coming right before the big crossover it seems like these are going to be important characters and the solicit laid it on thick they let us know that this is like some extremely important characters so i would be on the lookout for this one this is one that your lcs may not be aware of i don't think it's gonna be hugely printed um i like that cover in the middle that's kind of my favorite cover of the three but i would be on the lookout for this one i think this is a Good stealth buy. I've mentioned this before. I got to feel like Buffy's coming back to some form of media at some point. Right. And I fixed your camera, got you raised up a little bit. Looked like you were sitting next to the king a little <laughs> Can't sit higher than the king. So now you're Yeah, and up. I was trying to struggle to like lean back and like, you know, <laughs> I was trying to, I'm glad you noticed that because I was trying to do a couple things so I didn't look so short. You're making a, you know, Brian's 6'3", I'm 5'10", so I start to feel some sort of way about it. Yeah, it's like Shaq and Kevin Hart over here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Starting to make me feel some sort of way, man. Yeah. But, yes, although pre-recorded, we are trying, we always do this in one take just because don't have the time with work day jobs and everything like that to do too much editing so we one shot it and mistakes are made but we, we also heard from you guys you guys you guys like that natural banter too so we wanted to keep the bolo show even though we're pre-recording we wanted to keep it it's magical messed up self <laughs> yes we got flaws y'all <laughs> <laughs> but keeping with the buffy verse next on the first appearance list was angel number four Right, so now this is one, now we talked about Arun Singh. This was a book, Arun Singh, when he was on the channel and he was talking about upcoming appearances. We talked about Once in Future, I mentioned, and we're going to talk about it again. He was heavy, he said, buy that book. The only other book that he was that adamant about was Angel Number 4. He, he told us in advance that this character... Um, that it appears in this book, Charles Gunn, which is kind of an, uh, I haven't got a chance to read this book. I will say that, um, which is an, un, sounds an unassuming name, but it will seemingly be incredibly important going forward into the crossover and with the angel series in general. So I've learned from just our interactions with Arun that when he makes a statement like that, when he puts himself out on a limb like that, you'll listen to him. He told us about once in the future, Look at what that book's done. He told us about something is killing the children. Look what that book's doing. So um, I will follow the money. I will follow his lead and go ahead and say that this is a book that I made sure to pick up. And, um, you know, if you're not on that Angel Buffy spec, I get you. I understand. I'm not going to try to sway you if it's not your thing. But if it's at all your thing, if it's something that you believe in, if it's if it's something that you've been buying into, this is an issue to grab. Um, and it'll definitely be lower printed than those first few issues that came out, as happens with most ongoing series. Right, and it looked like the incentive was a virgin cover of Angel Number Zero. Is that correct? 
Yes, yes, that's that's what I'm, I'm I haven't gotten my copies in yet, but that's what it's looking like from the solicitation. Um, it looks exactly like that uh, number zero, um, that like thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, except for the thank you very much had the um, the the, de- the demon face, right? I believe. Mm-hmm. So. Correct. But and then moving on into the next for first appearances this week, we have Batman Superman number one. Awesome, uh, awesome connecting covers there. Um, this was definitely also a book that um, easily, easily could have fit into the that like reader buzz column. Um, I think Batman Who Laughs alone had people interested in this series. This is what Brad, like the third Batman Superman series. None of them have done that well. Yeah, the last one did, I will say, poorly. Um, but this one, just putting Batman Who Laughs on the cover got people interested. Shout out to whoever in the DC comic marketing team decided to do this as a connecting cover with half of Batman Who Laughs on one cover and half on the other. Because it made speculators need to buy both copies. I think that was that was a genius move. Um, I, I like the cover B, but I just think that the, those two cover, kind of cover A's are going to hold water. And then again, shout out to our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, with that gorgeous Matina cover. Um, that that thing is phenomenal, um, and I think they've got the trade dress as well as that near virgin um, kind of DC cover B style for that uh, low low printed virgin cover. But um, I think that's an amazing cover as well. Um, and you know what? As far as a sneaky cover, watch out for those blanks. I think that's more of a long-term play. But, you know, Batman and Superman are two of the more popular characters to get sketches done at conventions. So I could definitely see those taking off in the future. Right. So I'm going to bring up the, the Frankie's cover real quick, which is what we got right on the screen now. Um, so, yeah, if you go to frankiescomics.com, he has that up there. He's got the trade dress. He's also got the Virgin. He's also got 9.8s available as well. So definitely check out Frankie's Comics if you're interested in the... Francesco Matina cover, who always does gorgeous covers, in my opinion. Yes, and you know what? It's star starting to rise again. We saw that fall off for a while, but it seems like Matina's on a comeback trail. Right. So then, next on the first appearance list, we have Absolute Carnage Lethal Protectors number... What was this, number one? Number one. And I will say, before we go further, I we did totally uh, omit the fact that the last book had the first appearance of the Shazam Who Laughs, who a lot of people were um anticipating a lot of talk calling him dark shazam but the book actually had at the end on the last page flash page shazam who laughs so we'll have to see whether uh, it's not spec i really believe in i think i think uh batman who laughs is batman who laughs but um we'll have to wait and see so we'll see how that one goes but yes moving on to um absolute carnage lethal protectors number one again another tie-in for absolute carnage these tie-ins are doing very well. The big news with this one is uh, Demi Goblin. Um, kind of, if, if you think of a Demi a Demi Goblin, it, you've got the A in there. It's a female. Um, she it appears it's Shriek or Shrek. I don't know how you pronounce that character's Shriek. name. Um, Shriek. Shriek. <laughs> Shrek. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad you did it this time. I I'm the one did, that always uh, I'm the one that always messes up names. I'm, I'm getting that reputation now, Brian. I think that's that's a that's a channel thing, buddy. That's something we share now. Um, and I almost did my Mike Myers uh, Shrek impression there, but you know, um, but yeah. So you may notice that she appeared on the cover uh, of Absolute Carnage number one. That was the Javier. Oh, now I'm getting myself into trouble. Mm, Garen. Javier G. Garen, Garen. There you go. Javier Garen uh, Young Guns variant. Um, there were a lot of smart speculators who saw that cover and said, you know what, they've got to be going somewhere with this. Um, and I I tended to agree, and then here you go. You've got uh, Demi Goblin showing up. Now, it is important to note, I I think this is the first appearance, not that um, Absolute Carter's number one Young Guns variant. It's We've seen in the marketplace that cover appearances don't tend to get honored as a first appearance. It's got to be in the guts of the book. So... I think that that cover is important, and if this character takes off, that cover will certainly take off. But it's not, I can't go so far as to say that that is a first appearance. I think this is the real first appearance. 
That's going to conclude the first appearance section this week, which is pretty good considering I think last week we had one book in it. Yeah, and it was a late printing, so we had to stretch <laughs> yeah. that one. Yeah, we were talking about uh, Captain Marvel's second print last week, wasn't it? Right, absolutely, and third print is on the way now. Right. So, real quick, before we go into the next section of the Bolo list, you guys watching the live chat, no, the conversation's off the hook, like we always say. This is why we do the pre-recording now with the premiere, so we can participate more in that live chat with everyone. But if you're watching this in the live chat, in the replay, or listening to the audio version, do us a favor, write us a review for the podcast. Or if you're watching it in the live chat or on the replay, click that thumbs up button for us. And if you haven't done so, subscribe, so that way you get notified every time a new video gets released. And... Jack refills his drink so he can keep giving us all this great nuggets of information. Yeah. I gotta keep I gotta keep my <laughs> mouth moist for all this new comic book day flavor. But and with that being said, we are going into the reader buzz section. And we just kind of talked about absolute carnage tie-ins, but now we are gonna talk about absolute carnage number two. All right, the main event of Absolute Carnage. And I mentioned to you, Brian, before the show that I read this book and I didn't get that same, like, excitement that I got with issue number one. I got to go back and read it again because I actually read several comics today. And I think sometimes when you do that, when you're going from, like, book to book to book to book, you don't have that same feel. Last week, I literally only, or or the last time the issue came out, I only read Absolute Carnage that week, or at least on release day. And, um... I think I need to go back and read it again to see if I get that that good Donny Cates feel. But you also got to remember, though, it's an it's a they come in arcs, just like movies or anything else. Right. So you're getting into the second act, and the second act isn't always like you're not at the climax yet, and you're not at the kickoff, jump off point to get, get yeah. everyone's attention. Now you're into the story building. So a lot of times that second issue, good, but <laughs> yeah, it won't meet those expectations of that oversized freaking. I don't even know what you want to call it. I mean, freaking right, that 80 greatness. pages or 60 pages, three chapters, that issue number one. And then it teased so much yeah. that didn't necessarily come to fruition yet in issue two. You see you see it developing for sure. You see development in that. Um, but you didn't really get fully where you wanted or I want to see it go. So um, I'll say this. I definitely like seeing Normie and Dylan continuing to be – together and in panels together it just lets me know that i think there's something coming there um but either way you know what i think if you're always going to compare to issue one it's going to fall short issue one was a home run this was but this was a good issue let us know in the chat i'd love to know how you guys felt about this issue um am i just off base on this one or is it you know was it was it just as good and then a lot of people have been talking about that Young Guns variant, Brian. You brought that up to me. Uh, you said you grabbed that one, didn't you? Yeah. Well, one, because I'm a big fan of Marco Cicchetto, but two, also as Nick at Slab Heroes had pointed out, is, and you kind of pointed out earlier, that these Young Guns variants, they're pointing to characters that seem to be fleshing out further on down the road in the story. So who knows? But gorgeous cover. I picked that one up, and I picked up the regular cover because all the other variants weren't available at my LCS. Right, and I think there's a lot of people talking about uh, Man Wolf. A lot of people are excited. Um, I will say there was some talk during the Hot and Cold show about would he appear in the um, She-Hulk show because they have a relationship. I would say no because you're looking at a Sony character. J. Jonah Jameson's son would probably not be able to cross over. But there definitely looks like they're trying to build this character up uh, within the kind of Venomverse, Spider-Man universe. So definitely a character to keep your eye on, though, for sure. So moving on into the next one, the reader buzz, is House of X number three. Just like Jack does, I've done it before myself, House of X, Powers of X. Each week we're getting a new book, and sometimes it's easy to confuse the title. So on the Bolo list, we have Powers of X. But everyone knows what book we're talking about because it's the book you see when you go to the comic book store. And this week it was House of X. Right, and now again, it doesn't matter whether we're talking House of X, Powers of X, issues one, two, three. It doesn't matter. They're fifteen dollar books. That's what's going on right now. And it's funny. My whole pump and dump rant went to somebody trying to tell me that, um, you know, issue number what was it, number two or yeah. whatever, wasn't going to be a fifteen dollar book. Uh, well, issue number 
one, two, and three of both all House and Powers of X have all become fifteen dollar books. And I, it's not that I'm some sort of you know psychic prognosticator. It's just when you do this long enough and you start to see these trends, you start to realize what's gonna what's kind of playing out here. And this is just a prime example of stores, even though they had an opportunity with issue number three to kind of meet that reader demand, they may be meeting the reader demand of their initial issues number one and two, which is still a large jump up for an issue number three, because we've talked about this on the channel. I keep referencing this interview with James Hake on the Indie Spotlight series, where he talked about the traditional drop in circulation going from issues number one to two to three. But the problem is with these House and Powers of X, it's a lot like how we talked about on the Bolo show last night, or excuse me, on the um, Hot and Cold show last night about the way uh, the boys TV show has been. This was something that the more people talk about it, the more people are jumping on board. I know a lot of people who are not big X-Men fans, people like Brian. And the more you they hear, man, this is an incredible series. This is something you've got to read. You're more apt to check it out. You're more apt to read it. You're more apt to buy the issues. And that's what we're seeing with this. This is... Straight up reader buzz. <clears throat> There's some spec in there in different issues, but it's not a spec driven. These are not spec driven. And again, you know what? I got to pat, pat myself, pat my man Brian on the back a little bit again. When we started working as a team on this channel, one thing we wanted to drive home was the power of reader buzz. The fact that reader buzz can drive sales. We got laughed at. We got told we were wrong. We got comments in articles saying, well, we don't care what you guys want to read. And it's not about what we want to read. It's about when the masses all have a similar opinion about reading something. It can literally drive speculation. We've seen it with Immortal Hulk. We've seen it with the, everything Donny Cates writes. And we're seeing it here now with Jonathan Hickman's House and Powers of X run. I am excited to see where this is going to go in the future. I hope it translates into the individual X books. I'm skeptical because there's going to be so many different ones. But I hope that this is an X-Men renaissance. I think that's good for the hobby. That's good for the market. And that'll be good for these future X-Men films in the MCU. And uh, I always say buy what you like. And I always tend to like the covers that aren't the ones that are hot. Because I love that Jeff DeCall cover on there. Uh, other covers are going for more money. But to me, Jeff DeCall always does gorgeous work. But part of the reason why... Seems like those, uh, those Huddleston covers yeah. people seem to like. And those and flower then, uh, variants. Yeah, yeah, and then the connecting covers. Yeah. The connecting covers are where the money's at. Yep. Clearly, that's people are jumping all over those. It'll be interesting to see when this series is all done what a set of all 12 connecting covers will do on the secondary market because people are seriously building those those sets. Yep. Or if they end up pulling a Game of Thrones on you and the story doesn't end as good as it's out at the end, yeah. <laughs> that happens, man. That happens more often than not, unfortunately, so we'll see. Right. And then moving into the next book, we have Marvel Comics 1000. There was so many covers on here that I just put a couple on, which, of course, my favorite cover is the biggest one on the screen, and that was that first came out at D23 Expo, but then we got one per store, I think it was, right, for this? Yeah. Seemed, seemed like it. I think the one per store on that uh, Mickey variant, and I agree with you, man. I'm not, you know, the funny thing is I'm not, Probably. I'm a Disney fan. Absolutely. I've got two young children. I've been a Disney fan my entire life. But I'm not I'm not half the Disney homer that Brian is. So, I, you know, I know he's excited for that one. For me, I can even look at it from a speculation perspective and say, this is the first cover involving Mickey Mouse. This is the first kind of like acknowledgement of the Disney ownership of Marvel. This is an important book in my eyes. This is an important piece of Marvel history. Um, the cover's gorgeous, if you just look at the artwork of it. Um, look at the I, attention to detail in the background with, like, the Hulk poster and everything, you know, all the, the nostalgia and, like, this, the short box with the X sticker on it. And it's just... Yeah, Rob Liefeld pointed out Deadpool in the background. Yeah. And, um, you know, it seems like they really worked hard to get all corners of the Marvel Universe. You know, yeah, you, yeah, Brian, you know how to work hard. Well, I was going to say, leave it to Rob Liefeld to point out. <laughs> not something else. <laughs> he, not something else. someone else. But, you know. He said he said his wife uh, showed him, but yes, <laughs> um, absolutely. And uh, it's funny though you mention it because you actually left my favorite cover out, which is the one that you showed me. You picked up yeah. uh, from your LCS today that Tedesco um, incredible She Hulk variant. And if I mean now She Hulk's timely spec right now, right? But at the same point, 
that's just a gorgeous cover. Even if no one cared about She-Hulk, I think that's an incredible cover. You saw some cover heavyweights like Gabriel Delato, J. Scott Campbell appearing on the screen. It's funny how some of them have been overlooked. I'll say shame on retailers who are charging over cover price for some of these cover price variants. I've seen a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, a lot of $12, $15 prices on books that should be cover price. Um, but at the same point, um, a lot of great covers to choose from. Definitely an important book. I feel like every Marvel fan should buy this book, some cover of it at least, just for the history of it. Um, you know, it was something at first I thought was going to be a gimmick. But I, I think it's a very unique thing that they did, having kind of like each page, each section be written by a different kind of corner of the Marvel writing team. Different, you know, everybody got their shot. Um, there's actually also spec in here because we see the debut or first appearance or I don't know what you want to call it of the Eternity Mask. Um, and you know, every artist did it a little differently, kind of into their time period. Um, I don't know if there's any spec there. I don't know who's wearing the mask. I don't know what whether it's a new character, whether it's an existing character, whether it's going to turn out to be Stan Lee. I don't have any idea um, if, if there's solid spec there or not. I will say it's more than I expected going in. And the big news surrounding this book has been Mark Wade. Um, you know, I don't want to get too much into it, but Mark Wade wrote a essay like is in each of the kind of chapters or pages of the book. And the, and the essay is supposed to come from the character's perspective, and it was definitely more Mark Wade's political perspective, um, which, like I said, I'm not going to get into that because that just is going to cause division, and we don't want that, um, whether you agree or disagree with it. Either way, this is a celebration of the history of Marvel and Disney, and you got to be careful when you're one talking for Captain America, a guy who represents each and every one of us. Um, and, and that's not to say I don't agree with some of what he said or not agree. It's nothing to do with that. It's just that's a big weight. And you're writing for Captain America. That's a big weight. So that Marvel decided to change that from the original um, preview that dealers got. Is it, honestly, it's a non-story. I, like, I have to mention it because if I don't mention it, um, it's going to be brought up. Um, but it's a non-story because the only reason anyone knows about it is because LCS has got to preview the book. And then it was changed from the preview and that's about it it's not like it's an error or recalled printing or anything that you guys should go running out and trying to grab um just a little kind of blurb that nobody will remember a couple months from now right so we're gonna move on into the next book on the reader buzz and we're gonna talk about action comics number 1014 a lot of people are looking forward to 1015 but we have an appearance in 1014 right and who's that of Right, Naomi. Naomi in the mainstream continuity. And if you can tell, I'm excited I am because I have said it before, I'm a big believer in Naomi. Um, I, this is kind of getting to be typical, guys, of what we see from both Marvel and DC. I think when you have an expected appearance, like we know Naomi's coming and she's on the cover of Comics 15, I think we need to start paying attention to these issues beforehand. Wouldn't you say, Brian? Yes. I mean, it seems like this is what's happening. This is what happened with Star, right? I mean... Everybody was expecting that issue 9 or 10, and we got it in 8. Um, I I think about the way people are anticipating Venom with Venom 19. Could it be Venom 18 where we see, you know, that Dylan transformation of some sort? Um, I, I don't know. I'm speculating, guys. That's what this is. This is just talk. Uh, I don't know. But everybody was highly anticipating Naomi showing up in Action Comics uh, 1015, that cover with her on the cover is gorgeous. I mentioned on this channel that it was a book I pre-ordered um, pre-FOC. Um, this one definitely slipped past me, but I, I made sure to grab it because I think it's going to be important. Um, I think that the print run on this book will be less than 1015 because people saw 1015 coming. Um, and it's you, people are going to give me KO versus full. It's not even a first appearance, so it doesn't really matter. But um, it's it's important in that it continues to solidify Naomi's importance in the DC universe. Definitely. <clears throat> then moving right along, we're going to go into IDW with another big title, and that's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 97. Huge, huge issue. Um, Jenica gets her mask. We knew this was coming. We talked about it. Tom Waltz put it out there on Twitter, so we knew that this was going to be a move. Um, Speculation-wise, this is kind of a dud. And I'll tell you this. We saw this coming, didn't we, Brad? Yes. 
It just it's the what typically happens when everyone sees something coming a mile away. Um, it's funny. There's a lot of talk about oh, you shouldn't talk about things pre FOC. It's never people like Brian or myself who talk about a book pre FOC that causes what happens with this book to happen. It's when it's just public knowledge put out by whether the creators or the publisher. That's when it happens. It's never because Brian and I say buy, you should buy this book pre FOC. So Tom Waltz immediately tweeted out what was going to happen. And that, if you're not familiar with Tom Waltz, he's the writer of the, the series. Um, he will be jumping off this book at issue number 100. He's written the first 100 issues. He's been the, kind of the curator of all things TMNT. Um, but yeah, so he um, he put it out there. We all knew it was coming. Stores jumped all over store variants. There's several store variants of this issue. Again, shout out to our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics who did that uh, Vasquez kind of like sketch Jenica cover limited to 500 and sold out in like an hour. Like it, they, it was in and out. You, if you missed that window, you didn't get it. Um, and again, I don't blame retailers for cashing out on this monumental issue. Now, because of it, it cover A and cover B were so heavily, heavily, heavily ordered. Uh, and that's why they're still available at most retail, large retail outlets. Cover C, that one in ten variant, was sold for at Midtown for thirty four dollars. Yeah. We, we've talked on this channel how we hate retailers like Midtown trying to play the speculation game, trying to drive that price up. Um, that's what they get. That's why they're sitting on them. If they priced it at twelve dollars or something like that, they'd be sold out right now. Um, but you know what, Brian? I mentioned this to you before the show. My favorite cover. You know I'm a long-term play guy. Yeah, that's what I talk about on this channel. This I very well could have slotted into my long-term play. The only reason why it's not is it was obvious. I feel like we've talked about every issue of Ninja Turtles since 95. Um, and we're going to talk about Ninja Turtles with 98 for sure and probably 99 and 100. So I um, wanted to talk about something a little different, a little bit more off the radar with that G.I. Joe book. But cover B, that Eastman cover featuring Jenica on the cover. I mean, that is the first Jenica Ninja Turtle cover that's not a retailer exclusive. I really think there's some serious long-term value in that book. If you look at these three covers, which book screams why this book is important? You want to talk about cool subtlety? Look at that yellow trade dress. Yeah. Um, that's something that you may not have picked up on until I said it right there. Um, the yellow trade dress at the top and at the bottom with the City of War. Um, she's got her bandana on. That panel where Splinter gives her the mask and tells her, you know, uh, try this on. Um, you know, you, you may like wearing this mask more than you think. And she puts it on. It just feels like an important moment in Turtle lore. And uh, I think this book has some serious, serious staying power. And, you know, we live in a kind of no patience speculation community. So it, this book can easily be panned or people can think, oh, Turtle spec is over. It's not... This is just what happens. I hope that this causes people to order 98 less, and then that'll allow us to make some money on 98. Um, and there's going to be some big events in 98 that we already know about. Um, so we may see the same thing from 98. Either way, I said since the start of being on this channel, my my favorite thing is speculating on these IDW properties, but I never, ever anticipated on speculating on them and flipping them the week they come out. The game has always been to let the market dry out and then make your money. And I just think that's what you're going to have to do with these uh, if you grab them. If you grab them and you want to dump them, there's going to be plenty of people looking to pick them up from you. Um, I will probably be picking up uh, that cover B for a while and stashing that. I, I really like that one long term. So moving on into the reader buzz, we're going to go into Absolute Carnage, Miles Morales, number one, right? Right. This is another one where, um, you know, we, this is featured in two categories on this list in the reader buzz. I think every Absolute Carnage tie-in is going to end up in the reader buzz section. People are reading these tie-ins more than I've ever seen tie-ins read. I don't want to rehash things we've already talked about, but what Brian and I have talked about comparing it to War of Realms, how... Most of these tie-ins get skipped. It seems like Absolute Carnage is the exception to that rule. People are reading these tie-ins, and because of that, it's always going to end up on the Reader Buzz section. Also, Miles Morales is really popular right now. I mean, that seems like a redundant, obvious statement. Um, he's been popular for some time, but all the stuff going on with like the Dark Miles and all of that, 
that definitely has people's attention. Um, there's Miles back issues tearing up the back issue uh, list. Having said that, this one was all about that Javier Guerin. Guerin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The one that was classified, right? That had the classified it's, cover. Every time Marvel does that, that book is guaranteed to sell out. Um, I don't really know if this doppelganger is solid spec. If I'm being quite honest with you about that, I've seen this stuff in comics a lot, and it doesn't tend to stick, right? But having said that... Um, I think this is a great cover price pickup and flip right now because that book is going for what, Brian? Like 15, 20 bucks? Yeah. So, you know, I don't begrudge anybody who's making that move at all, especially why this uh, series is going on for sure. Yeah. I, I ended up picking up one because it was cover price. <clears throat> I wanted the Lupacino cover just because I like Lupacino, even though it's Black Cat on the cover. But I did like that. And I got a copy of the regular cover just because, like you mentioned, really. In, Miles Morales, Sp Spider-Man, we also got a new subscriber, so thank you to Jason. But right now, I enjoy reading the Miles Morales Spider-Man more than any other Spider-Man book out right now. I did like uh, Peter David when he was writing 2099, and Matina was doing the covers for that. But as of right now, my favorite Spider-Man title to read is the Miles Morales Spider-Man. My favorite is Spider-Man Life Story, which also came out today. Um, you know, the truth is, between Spider-Man Life Story and the I would say Amazing Spider-Man is coming in third on the uh, best reads of Spider-Man right now. Right. And with the with the upcoming J.J. Abrams Spider-Man series, right. we may see that trend continue. I don't know. So. But keeping with Spider-Man, we're getting into the next book on the Reader Buzz, and we're going to talk about Venom number 17. This was a spec book. You know, this was everyone trying to play with the, is this where we're going to get the Dylan yeah. moment? Um, didn't happen. Still advance the story, still a great issue. It really reminds me of Venom 16, which was a great issue. And if you weren't kind of like putting all your eggs in one basket, you'd have enjoyed. A lot of people, though, didn't. Um, two great variants, I'll also say. The, I, you and I have laughed at these bring on the bad guys variants, but they're starting to sell out. Yeah. Um, I think I think it may be a supply and demand thing. I think um, LCSs are really tired of these um, themed variants. Um, now, the 80th anniversary ones we're going to talk about, I'm not surprised those are selling out because of the nostalgia factor of them. The Bring on the Bad Guys, I'm a little more surprised. But like I said, I think it's a, I think it's a supply and demand thing. Either way, both of those covers, I think, are very nice. Well, both of those variant covers. That Bring on the Bad Guys, that was uh, Inhoc lead on that one? Or was that... I think it was... I mean, is it Scon or Inhoc um, in Ugly? One of the two. Yeah. Either way, both... And let us know in the chat. Yeah. One of us is right, one of us is wrong. Yeah. I don't really care who it is. But either way, both of them are extremely popular. Yeah. Artists, and very so. similar. Yes. So. <laughs> Moving on, we're going to get into the vault book this week, and that was Mall Number 1. This is one book that I actually got to read an advanced copy of because I didn't get to read any books that came out yet today. But I have read Mall Number 1 and thoroughly enjoyed it. I was able to get an advanced PDF right around San Diego Comic-Con. They had... Uh, previews for this book their vault was handing out there it had mall number one then it had like a three or four page preview to uh the plot right i believe but mm -hmm. great story another one of those apocalyptic type stories where culture's destroyed everyone's pretty much living in a mall and they're divided by class from you know higher class to lower class and a higher <coughs> class son gets accused of murder and they basically banish him and he has to live outside the mall where evidently there's creatures and monsters. And that's where the first issue leaves you. But it left me wanting more. And I can't re wait. I can't wait to read the second issue on this one. Yeah, now that's actually a very good, uh, a very good review there, Brad. So yeah, yeah, I've been practicing. I was, I was saying it in a mirror like 20 times. Because no. <laughs> I have not read this book. And that was, you got me interested in it. Um, if you know anything about me, you know I have worked in a lot of malls. And I think there's some good parallels with um, talking about classism in malls because, you know, malls tend to get broken up. This is the white mall. This is the black mall. This is the rich mall. This is the poor mall. This is the this. This is the that. And then even within your malls, um, this is something that maybe you haven't noticed, but the stores that are on the top floor tend to be of a different economic class from the stores on the bottom floor and so on and so forth. So, um I don't know if that's where Vault Comics was going with it. I have a feeling maybe that was sort of the thought. 
but um, it's it's definitely um, I feel like a good setting for a story like this. What is the, uh, the the homage cover? I've been trying to figure out what is that from, Brad. <laughs> I was doing the same thing too, but I want to say it wasn't uh, kind of reminds me of the the Punisher. The oh yeah, the uh, was it the uh, Punisher the uh, magazine yeah. right? That's I mean that's what I thought of. I might be totally wrong, but that's what the homage kind of reminded to me. Yeah, it definitely feels like one of those old Marvel magazines for sure. Um, and then, you know what, Brad, I think we'd be remiss not to talk about the controversy surrounding this book, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, we did an interview. I mentioned the, the James Hake interview. The night that we did that interview with him, he was red hot, wasn't he, Brad? Yes. Because that was when this book had just been announced. And obviously, Scout has an extremely popular series called The Mall. And when this book was originally solicited, it was solicited as being called The Mall. Um, and there were some cease and desist. There was some um, legal back and forth. We have, I mentioned uh, Mel V. Mel V refuses to read this book out of protest and support of James Hake, um, who, yeah, we love James Hake, but, you know, I'm going to read comics, man. But, uh, you know, their vault to kind of avoid that lawsuit, they dropped the 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 from the title. So now we have the mall from Scout and mall from um, – from uh, Vault, and um, I, I get where James Hague's coming from. You got to protect your own. If this is the Bolo show, if somebody came out with this show and they called it the Bolo, I guess I would, or Bolo show, I guess I would have a problem with that as well. So I get where he's coming from. It's tough because Mall and the theme and concept behind Malls are kind of generic. Um, seems like anybody can do it, but. Um, it was probably a much ado about nothing. I don't think that it's been anything more than a couple headlines when the initial lawsuits happened. But still, you, you know, it's something to keep an eye out for. It'll be interesting to see what happens with adaptation. If this movie, this gets adapted into a movie similar to the way the mall from Scout is getting adapted, we may see some title changes, and we'll see how that affects speculation long term. So evidently, it's a Blade homage. Blade, okay, but. Be on the lookout for blade homages. Uh, <laughs> might have uh, might have a little something uh, coming down the works, but yeah, be on the lookout for blade homages. <laughs> Definitely, but yeah. So don't recognize them all, and I'm sure we'll get comments on that. Oh, didn't know it was a blade homage. <laughs> <laughs> what are they hey, li doing? Listen, I'm gonna be honest with you. Vault's had a couple that I haven't known straight from from looking. Uh, and that was a fun part of that conversation, talking with the Wassel brothers about how they go about choosing these homages. And some of them are really obvious. Like when you look at um, the previews and upcoming FOC, you're looking at things like the first Swamp Thing uh, or Deadly Class Number 1. Those are real obvious. But that Adventure Comics 381 one, I had to look that one up. I had no idea. Yeah, I remember it was um... – I remember, it was, I remember the, the cover it was representing. I couldn't remember the issue. I remember it was a Supergirl – type cover right yeah well, that was for sarah and the royal star yeah and look who are we to talk we made uh queen of bad dreams and we did the first one we did was uh detective comics 31 and everybody started hitting us up saying they had no idea what that was <laughs> yeah so, like, that so, cover is ugly man <laughs> so so what do we know right you know so yeah we liked it we felt good about it but you know didn't work out like that then yeah. but anyway copy still available comicbookinvest.com hit that variant tab definitely and now you know that we make mistakes. That's my first one I think I've ever made, though, just to be honest. So we, ever. Yeah, ever. Ever. So won't let that happen again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on into the next one on the Reader Buzz, though, we're going to go with Mountainhead, number one. This is another one where Midtown played that game with the speculation, with the variants. They, they got those that Stegman variant for $20. Um uh, again, don't love that they do that. It's got it's. I think uh, clearly collectors don't like it either because it's still available, and I don't know that it would be available if they would have priced it normally. And then again, when it sells out, then we start to get that speculation buzz of, oh man, it sold out at Midtown. So we didn't really get that. They limited one per copy on the regular cover. The story sounds interesting to me. This was one I liked from the onset of previews. You're looking at, you know, a thriller kind of horror story. Um, 
you know, you've got an expedition and there's a lone survivor and um, definitely one that sounds like it could be very dark. We've talked about this on the Hot and Cold show. Horror is hot right now. So I'm interested in this book. I ordered this book. Um, I would matter of fact, I ordered 10 copies so I could get the incentive myself. Um, I haven't gotten them in yet. I'm anxious to read this one for sure. I like that Stegman cover though, man. Ryan Stegman is a guy, you know, a few years ago, I wasn't a big Stegman fan. Um, when he was on amazing Spider-Man, I, I really thought of him kind of like a B artist, but he linked up with Donnie Gates and, uh, I have become a major, major Ryan Stegman fan. He's hot right now. Absolute carnage is on fire. So I've got high hopes for that. Um, that that uh retailer uh incentive variant taken off and here's the thing guys remember if it's 20 bucks at midtown they, and you're buying it at, at at um ratio for 10 midtown's already made you a 10 dollar profit because they basically set the market price higher than you're buying it so that's the key that's the key to remember is even if it takes a little while um you're already good i think that this book has the makings of a 10 dollar cover a and a, a 20 to 30 dollar incentive we're just gonna have to probably give this one a few weeks but let us know in the chat since i haven't gotten a chance to read it yet if you read it what did you think every time every time i giggle because every time i say it's hot right now i think of mugatu from zoolander that <laughs> <laughs> hansel's so hot right now but <laughs> moving moving into the reader buzz next one we got is was this justice league number 30 Justice League number 30, and this is Reader Buzz for kind of one reason and one reason only Scott Snyder told us to pay attention to this book. This kicks off the Doom War, right? Right. Scott Snyder said this was the book that he has been waiting to write. This is the book that he was excited for. He put it all over Twitter. Kicks off Doom War. I was excited for that. Continue. I've enjoyed reading about like the development of Lex Luthor. But the big thing is that last page, splash page, reveal that the Justice Society of America is back. Um, the JSA. Now, I got to admit, I've never been a big JSA fan. I think I'm a little young for that. Uh, Mid-30s, I think that tends to connect with an older crowd. But as a speculator, I pay attention to what other people are excited about. Again, I told you I'm not inherently a Buffy fan or inherently a Power Ranger fan. Um, these are not things that I grew up with per se, but I've watched what other people are getting excited about, and I take note, and people like JSA, so the reintroduction of JSA seems to have people interested. Didn't you get a little bit of fandom for JSA since you watched the CW Flash show, though? I did. I did a bit, and even more so with the, um, what's it called? The uh, time travel. Right. The time travel show. Now I can't remember what the name of the show is. It's been on the off season for too long. Come on, CW. <laughs> I need my shows back. But, uh, yeah, Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah. There we go. Yes, even more for Legends of Tomorrow. But that was something where I actually had to kind of, like, look things up from time to time. Um, you know, I wasn't really familiar with all of the characters, per right. se, when they first debuted. But um, I, I definitely think that people are excited about this, though. Yeah. So, yeah, and then the last one for the Reader Buzz section this week was Dark Horse's Tommy Gun Wizards. This was, like... Al Capone, Elliot Ness, but with a little bit of magical touch to it, right? Yeah, I don't know how I feel about this one. Part of me says, again, um, this would be like a hard movie. Would they make an Elliot Ness, Tommy Gunn, or uh, Tommy Gunn, would make an Elliot Ness, Al Capone movie with um, wizards and stuff? Uh, we've already had so many good Elliot Ness, Al Capone. Uh, can you touch the untouchables, really? I don't know. It'll be um, but, uh, right when they get done making Sharknado movies. <laughs> but and it's funny because I wanted to read this because I've started rewatching Boardwalk Empire, mm. so I want it kind of fits into that. And then also, it's got Christian Ward in it, you know, attached to this book, and that alone is enough for me to want to pick the book up. Right, I like Christian Ward. I think his art is incredible. He's writing this book, yes. isn't he? Yeah. So that so you get a little different feel with Christian Ward here. Um, I know some of my CBSI brothers who have were commenting in the chat were maybe underwhelmed by the first issue but intrigued to go forward so that's kind of a lot of times that's all you can ask for a first issue is just to keep people on the hook and willing to pay another four or five dollars to read issue two so i think it did its job I, i'm i'm anxious to read this one um i you know i know i get i'm gonna get killed in somebody's gonna say in the chat or a comment it's not all about whether they make a movie well again mm -hmm. we're speculators so a lot of times it is about if they make a movie um especially when we're talking about independent comics see here's where you can't get me from both sides you can't sit here and go well independent comics oh it's a burn and turn if you don't make money the first week they're you know they're never worth anything 
and then say, well, it's not about making movies because that's how it becomes not a burn and turn situation is that when everyone fades off and pays attention to something else, then that speculation comes back into play when things get optioned. And um, you can sit here and say, well, everything gets optioned. That's another thing you hear. But um, yeah, but a lot of them get made into movies. Not everything is ever always going to get made. That's the nature of Hollywood. But again, first look deal with Dark Horse and Netflix. Um, will we see Tommy Gun Wizards on Netflix? I don't know. It's really it's hard for me to predict these Dark Horse properties. I'm not a huge Dark Horse guy, but I, I'm trying to grab Dark Horse number ones um, in anticipation that some of them are going to end up on Netflix. Let us know in the chat if you guys are doing the same. If they can make that many freaking Spy Kids movies, they can make a Tommy Gun Wizards movie. And DJ Qualls got to be the bad guy, and then Fred Savage should be Elliot Ness. <laughs> But we I'm mentioned... all about some more Fred Savage, baby. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's already been in one wizard movie. <laughs> <laughs> but also, we talked about Christian Ward a lot. It's important to know that a lot of people are talking about that B cover, and that was um, Declan Shelby, I think, I believe, that did the variant for that, right? Right. That's another artist who I think is underrated. I like Declan Shelby. And with that, that brings us to the end of the reader buzz. But before we get into the variant buzz section real quick, make sure you guys hit that thumbs up button for us. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing so you'll always be notified of future content. Because like we're going to tell you at the end of this show, we have some great new content lined up. But before we get into that, we are going to get into the variant buzz. And the top. <laughs> and thank you, Eddie, for subscribing. <laughs> Shout out to you, Eddie. Yes. It's always good to be interrupted with su subscribers. So thank you Never so much because that. that's what it's about, the community, and we really appreciate it. But the first book on the Reader Buzz section was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is number 96, the second print, correct? Right. <laughs> that's how I feel about that one. Um, you know, I'm already not huge on that issue because, you know, you got the – the old comics politicians coming out there, stomping their feet, saying it's a first full appearance of Jenica, and I don't agree with that. And then IDW, what are you doing? In 95, you did a great job. You, you gave us a new cover art on the second print, and then you come to 96, and you do this. I just And ultimately, we know 97 is probably going to have a second print. This, to me, just tells me it was, it was kind of, I don't know, rushed, or they didn't plan on doing it at first, or I don't know. Just... Yeah, but why? Why rush it, man? Give us another week. Come out with it next week. Uh, there's so much stashed turtle art out there. Um, you're not gonna tell me Ben Bishop couldn't have whipped up another gem real quick. I don't. I don't like this. I just this to me is like pointless. So how does that make you feel? <laughs> Disappointed, man. I feel let down. <laughs> That's why yellow makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we're talking Jenica, baby, then yellow gets me hype. Yes. But, although that makes us sad, we talked about this next one previously, but we're going to talk about it more right now. We're talking about those Marvel 80th frame variants. Right, we talked about this uh, it was a week or two ago when these first started debuting, and you know Brian and I both talked about the nostalgia of the original releases. Yeah, we got hit in the feels. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't matter to us, um, and I think most guys our age, mid-30s to early 40s, it, didn't really, it doesn't really matter if... Um, you're talking from a value perspective. We all love those covers. Um, you know, and it, and it kind of depends on who you are, or which one's your favorite. I talked about G.I. Joe 53 being one of my favorites as a kid growing up. I had a beater copy as a child that I never let go of. I still have to this day. And it was one of those ones I had to go get a minty copy as an adult, well, whether it was the Star Comics releases that are all serious back issue gold. Um these being re-released, I instantly was gravitating towards them. I just think, again, nostalgia reminds you of a, of a time. Um, but it seems like the market is drifting our way too, Brian, because these things are selling out all over online shops, whether it's Midtown, TFAW, my comic shop. It uh, doesn't really matter. They are selling out. What they do in the secondary market, we'll have to kind of wait and see whether they're just going to be a couple dollars over cover price type releases or not. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the sets go for, for those who are able to compile entire sets that will be interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I, these are ones I'm a big fan of. I'm glad to see that other people are. It's also cool to see some like different characters being featured on the covers. Like you see Gamora, um, that is Gamora, right? On the Avengers cover. That's what it looks like to me. 
Yeah, that's what I would think. Um, but I also thought it was a Punisher homage cover earlier, so. <laughs> so who knows, right? Uh, I'm sure you guys will let us know when we're wrong. But, uh, yeah, so I think the Spider-Man cover is real cool. I know you're a Thor guy. Um, you know, these these covers, I think, are going to be popular. So it's something to keep an eye out for going in um, future weeks when they release more of these. Um, if you see them at your LCS for cover price, which they should be cover price because they're not incentive variants. Come on, LCSs, let's play the game right, baby. But uh, those those may be worth a grab for sure. Right. Yeah. Quit looking up prices on eBay, you comic book store owners. You're you're the first market, not the second market. Yeah. So stop paying attention to the second market. That's that's not for you. Yeah. That's how you that's how you go out of business and you got no market. Yes. God God diversify. <laughs> diversify. <laughs> yeah. Getting nutty, hitting past midnight. But anyways, you know, Goni Montez, always right. doing these foil variants. This is the foil variant for Power Rangers number forty-two. This is a little, little bit reminds me of TMNT ninety-six. Not the negatives that I talked about about the second print, but about the fact that this is not about the issue itself so much as I think a lot of us that are buying these Power Ranger um, this arc are all in on these foil variants. Um, and it's funny because, like, the issue number 40 foil went on sale at Midtown for $1.80. Yeah. Go look at eBay. Still solidly selling for 10 bucks shipped regardless of being $1.80. Did not slow anyone down. Um, I think that the foil variants are going to be money for a long time. I think that people are going to want them as a set. Um, they're not even that new because they were doing these Goni Montez variants – um, and I think I think actually Mercado did some of these style variants early on. So the, this is this is kind of like that seminal thing from Power Rangers that's going on right now that people want. Um, again, this necessary evil storyline is huge. Don't wait till issue 49, 50, 49, I think is the end of the of the arc till some of these big reveals come out. And Brian, I got to tell you, we told you so, uh, you know, our lips are sealed, but. Check out those FOC variants, those kind of uh, Dan Mora story page variants. Um, and check out these foil variants. Because first off, the FOC variants are low printed. These foil variants are just gorgeous. Issue 42 right here, you get the pink ranger front and center. Um, I'm actually and, liking the foil variants better than the, like, the Chris Anka and Senna variants. Me too, yeah. You know, if I got to be critical, I don't love the Chris Anka and Senna variants. Um they're kind of cool, but, you know, like I said, the coolest part about them is the back. Yeah. And you can't really see that in a bag and board. So they kind of just look basic versus these foil variants, which are just – I when I issue 40 in, I was stunned by how good-looking they are in person. Um, they're, I tell you what, from somebody who sets up at conventions, they're easy sells to Power Ranger fans because of how gorgeous they are. So I'm going to keep ordering those foil variants. Um, and I'm going to put sets together, and I think the sets are going to perform well. Another thing is that I, it just solicited was the short boxes, those um, themed short boxes. Boom's got one coming out with the different like foil covers on the outside. I think that a lot of collectors are going to want that box to put theirs in. I know I do. Uh, Boom Studios, hook a brother up. Come on, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love those boxes. Those are cool. But um, – yeah, I think that's a great idea. So I think these are going to continue to be popular. And then the last book we're going to talk about on the variant buzz is the Once in Future number one second print. A lot of reports that, one, a lot of orders got allocated. People that ordered them, even before FOC, their orders got allocated. They might have ordered 25, they got eight, and then the rest of the order was getting pushed to third print. Third print is getting allocated. We're on, what, fifth print, I think, might, might have just sold out. And... This book was also just announced as now it's no longer a mini series. We are having an ongoing series. Right. Now, a lot of are going to wonder why is this the long term play? The long term play is my pick. It's not necessarily what the market This is this is the best book of the week. If you're flipping, if you're speculating, if you're trying to make money on new comic book day releases, this is the book you should have been hunting today without any shadow of a doubt. There's no there's nothing that even is comparable when you look at secondary market sales. Maybe That's the D twenty three Expo might kind of, but this maybe. Is, but then you got to look at ROI. What yeah. were you buying that D twenty three? There's no store that was letting that thing go. I did. I will say there were a couple. Shout out to those stores who do stuff like this that were doing things like raffles 
for that book or hooking up maybe a customer who buys everything. Um, but if so you were a comic book store doing like you were supposed to, this was a cover price book. But there was also comic book stores out there selling it for $60. Right. Let me. That's who I do not feel bad for is if you got canceled – by a comic book store because a lot of people got their orders canceled that's the long story short of it they got canceled because of the allocations now we told you guys pre-foc about this book we also told you guys that this book was going to be limited now when you're talking about something pre-foc typically you can order all you want pre-foc but we still told you guys before foc that this was going to be limited so we we tried to warn you guys that things like this were going to happen now, Brian mentioned all these stores that did pre-sales. They are retail stores, and I'm not going to name anybody by name. I'm not going to take it to that level. Um, but there were some stores, some named stores, who were all over eBay selling 40, 50 copies of this book at high prices. Now, if you get canceled from that store, well, you know, they got allocated and they got problems on their hands, $40 a pop problems, you know. So it, that's where these stores are kind of – taking advantage of the situation and um it's it's a dangerous game to play i will tell you guys brian and i are both of the same opinion if you're a speculator i'm not even talking about from the store level be careful doing pre-sales i get why you guys like to do them i get that you know that pre-sale price a lot of times can be higher than any other price but that's the point do you really want to sell to a customer at a price that they'll never be able to attain that value back that, that's just creating – with the eBay system, with the 30-day returns, with the fact that I don't care if you put no returns, they can return it. That's a dangerous, dangerous move. What if there's damages? What if your LCS shorts you like so many of you are, are replying? And again, most of the LCSs are telling you the truth. They got shorted. They got allocated. It is what it is. But um, it's just for those reasons, it's not something I, I would say to do. But – I know that many of you Wednesday Warriors were out there hitting stores. I got tons of reports of you guys picking up two, three copies at, at your LCS for cover price. That's awesome because this is there's a huge return on investment. This is a book that people are excited about. Like Brian mentioned, it's gone to a fifth print. And because of that, it is now an ongoing series. That's the biggest win for speculators because most of these mini series don't ever pan out long term the way we hoped. Another thing to note is that third print coming down the pike, right, Brian? If, if, you, if you're worried that you got pushed back from a second print to a third print, well, what's that third print selling for pre-sale again? $30. So once in future is not going anywhere. And I want to make one more comment before we move on. There are some increasing reports. We had a picture on our Facebook page of some guy put up 20 copies of Cover A. That's part of the reason why this book is limited is because – some stores heard people talking about this book pre-FOC, talking about the first print, just the book in general. They put in large orders for cover A. Because they're still sitting with cover A, they think, well, I don't, I, I don't need second prints. The market's changing. If you own a store and you're listening to us, listen to this. The market's changing. You can't just think about second prints in terms of filling those reader orders or I'm sold out of the first print, so therefore I don't need the second print. When there is cover art changes, it essentially becomes a variant. It's essentially an entirely new book. So the just because you did not get uh, or you still had cover A's available does not mean that you should then not order this second print. Also, just because your LCS still has cover A's available – that means nothing to the speculation of this book because we mentioned this when we talked about this book uh, for the long-term play of the week. This wasn't available in my area anywhere. That's, that first print has been long gone. That first print mostly went to subscribers and then a couple on the shelf type deal because that's the way it is down in North and South Carolina. You don't tend to walk into shops and see 25, 30 boom number ones. Um, so if you are blessed enough to walk into a shop where you're seeing this book in mass, then you should be grabbing them. I'm not saying grab all 20, but you know, I talked to Andy Tomberlin, the writer of the Indie Spotlight series, when Die was out, and the same thing was happening with Die number one, the first print. There were people who were saying, Well, this isn't a good book. Um, I'm still seeing it at my LCS. Well, that's a thirty dollar book now, all day, every day. And the and it just took time for that book to sell out geographically everywhere because there are just if you're in san francisco los angeles new york um you know austin texas these are cities where they know to order these these independent comics heavy 
Um, if you're in Rock Hill, South Carolina, where I live and where I'm recording this video right now, you'll be lucky if you can find two on the shelf. And that's just reality. That's what we. We're, that's where we live. That's what what's going on. That's the market right now. So if you're sitting on a whole bunch of once and future number ones at your LCS, I, I advocate you grab them because here's the facts: the matter are it's a twelve to fifteen dollar book. Right. And it's important to note we talked about it a little bit, but something is killing the children hasn't even come out yet, and it's already on what third print. Right. So by the way, expect the same thing. Yeah. Like if it, you just see this and go in. Understand that this is coming. And also, don't rip on Boom for this because the reality is um, this is kind of a cool collectible. Not People have got, get kind of entitled out there um, you know, in all walks of speculation. Um, for something to be valuable, it needs to be limited. If everybody can get their hands on it, then it's not going to be as limited. You can't get mad about pre-FOC talk and then also get mad when you can't get a book. Um, it, you know. Doesn't work both ways, guys. That's that's life is not that convenient. So work hard, find you a copy as best you can, see if you what you can do. Um, but you know, not everything is going to be for everybody. This is a unique collectible and one that I think will be valuable because of it, because of its rarity. I also see the opposite side of that coin as well because um, Mike Morello writes cover tunes for ComicBookInvest.com. We had this discussion last night because um, a lot of people reporting. Hey, I pre-ordered it. They don't have it. I'm talking about the allocation. Yes, it's a great book, and yes, it's a good find. But if you can't get hold of it, it's, to me, it's not worth chasing for those prices. It's a comic book when it comes down to it. How many comic books come out a week? It's, you know, all right, you missed out on one. Move on because there's going to be something else behind it. Yeah, you and I have always had that attitude. We talk about that on the channel. Like Every week, how many books are we talking about are hot spec plays? Yeah. So if you if you tried to grab Dead End Kids number one and you didn't get it, don't get mad about it. You move on to the next week. There's going to be another book. It's always going to be that way. Yeah. Don't you know? Don't don't let things like that make you so upset that you then don't enjoy this hobby. Yeah. Or you ruin your relationship with your LCS. Yeah. I enjoy the thrill of the hunt, but sometimes it's just like on to the next one. But either way, so that wraps up the variant buzz section, and it is time for. Jack's long-term play of the week. And it's the one book, as always, we haven't discussed so far. And we are talking about G.I. Joe number 266. Now, when I say haven't discussed so far, I'm just talking about on this show. Because we've been talking about this book. We have. We have certainly been talking about this book. We talked about this book as soon as the solicitation came out. Similar to Power Rangers and the Unnecessary Evil Story. Or, excuse me, the Necessary Evil Story. G.I. Joe is a property that has an insane fan base. Now, it's not huge in numbers in the way like Marvel Comics and DC Comics are, but it, it, we're talking about a ravenous fan base. G.I. Joe books are tend to be pretty low printed, around that 10000 10, range. And because of that, there's enough to satisfy that Joe market, but there's not enough to satisfy the outside the Joe market. So when a storyline or a series gets hot, it tends to get hot, you know, really quickly and become valuable. And um, the last two runs that we've seen on GI Joe have happened in that 212 to 215 range, and in that 243 through two, um, I'd say 250. And both of those have one thing in common. And that thing is what is currently being reported on as a new solo movie coming out from The Hollywood Reporter. But we're talking Snake Eyes. Um, if you were ever a G.I. Joe fan as a kid, everybody's favorite Joe was Snake Eyes. Now, we all might have had our pet favorites. I'm a Deep Six guy. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that's the underwater. Um, Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, I love Sergeant Slaughter. By the way, Bolo, G.I. Joe 48 from Volume 1. Nobody realized that's first appearance of Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah. Nobody ever looks at that book. That's a good book. But anyways... Um, you know, I'm a WWE fan, so I'm a big Slaughter fan as well. But, yeah, you know, Snake Eyes is the character when we're talking G.I. Joe. There's just no doubt about it. Um, and you may have heard I just mentioned two different runs. Now, those two different runs are important because they play into this story. Um, in those two different runs, we have 212 through 215, the death of Snake Eyes and the crowning of a new Snake Eyes. So Snake Eyes, the original Snake Eyes, dies. And unlike most comic deaths, he's gone. We've gone um, 
couple of years now. And we haven't seen Snake Eyes return. Now, here's the key. His consciousness still exists, but he is gone as an individual. Um, his his uh, mentee, Sean Collins, um, who first appears in Volume 1 of G.I. Joe, issue number 30, and who, if you go read the back issue Bolo article, I kind of broke a couple of years ago that he actually appears in the back seat of his dad's car in issue number 29, so there's a little true first-ish cameo for you. Um, and uh, I never saw anybody talk about that before I did. Um, and he becomes Snake Eyes. Now, he's known in the IDW series as Kamakura. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but that's how I would uh, Shinsuke Nakamura style um, uh, pronounce it just based on reading it. Um, he is also known as Throwdown. That is his official G.I. Joe name. And um, he becomes Snake Eyes. He is then defeated. Um, they sort of hint at killed. Uh, Dawn Moreno takes over as Snake Eyes in that second story that we're talking about. Dawn Moreno first appears, I want to say, in G.I. Joe 226. I may be wrong about that issue number. But um, she appears as a character. Then she appears first appears as uh, Snake Eyes in 243. It's got that cover appearance in 244. Um 246, she's got that great design variant by Larry Hama that's incredibly popular. All the way up through 250, that's her main story, is uh, her as, G as Snake Eyes. Um, you can actually see her on the cover of that variant all the way to the right. That's that 1 in 15 incentive. Um, I believe it's by John Royal or uh, Royale. Um, she uh, has the original Snake Eyes in her, his consciousness in her head. So that allows her to kind of accelerate her training and her skill set. Um, and that also creates obviously all kinds of problems. Anytime you got somebody else in your head, think any Brock and, and Venom style, um, two people with one body, there's always going to be kind of some issues there. So incredibly popular story and an incredibly popular story where Sean Collins takes over. This storyline is called Snake Hunt. Now I got to say, out of all these covers, cover A is my favorite. That, that cover with... Um, Cobra Commander rolling the, the dice. That's a t-shirt right there. Oh, it is. And the, so many levels. Uh, you got the two snake eyes rolling snake eyes with the dice. Um, just a great, great, great cover. Um, but he becomes aware in this issue. I've got a chance to read this issue. I will say it was a little slower moving than I had hoped. I was ready to get into this action-packed story. Essentially, the whole story is the G.I. Joe's training and Cobra spying on them training. Um, and that's really kind of all that happens within that. But what you end up getting is you end up getting the fact that Cobra is now aware that there are two Snake Eyes. Cobra is now aware that Sean Collins' throwdown is wearing the Snake Eyes costume and that there is another Snake Eyes, um, the female Snake Eyes, who they've been doing battle with. And it becomes clear to them that they need to capture one of the snake eyes. And we know from the solicits, I think that they're going to capture Sean Collins and we're going to end up getting Sean Collins versus Dawn Marino. I think, I think they're working on technology where they're going to be able to, I believe implant snake eyes is um, his consciousness into Sean Collins. I don't really know where it's going to play out yet, but we're going to end up getting snake eyes versus snake eyes. And uh, I think that this is going to be the next big GI Joe story. Now, if you're a naysayer and you're going to say, well, I heard comments like um, on comicbookinvest.com article, Jack's a homer. Well, yeah, or a fanboy. You're right. Look at my logo. I'm clearly a G.I. Joe fan. If you've ever watched this channel, you know I'm a G.I. Joe fan. So there's no doubt about that. I love G.I. Joe. But number one, we say buy what you like, right? That's what we say on this channel. So I'm going to also talk about what I like because I can talk about it passionately. Also, something I'd like to share is how these speculation plays have done well for me in the past because I've done well with Power Rangers and I've done well with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And it's great to see that now in the market, others are doing well. So I will say with this G.I. Joe storyline, I expect these to do really well. But similar to the 212 and the 243 story, both of those times they had something in common. The first issue didn't do well upon release. So do not look at this issue and the fact that it's it's not sold out everywhere yet and say to yourself, well, no, he's wrong. 
Don't do that. Because like I said, not much happened in this issue. And if you wait for whatever issue, whether it's going to be um, 267 or 268, when we have that moment, that oh moment that inevitably will happen in this story, don't wait for that to happen to then go back and grab this because that is what has happened both other times. G.I. Joe collectors, they're completionists. They build these runs. They are also readers. And... So the G.I. Joe fan base, like I said, they make up enough to buy up all of this quantity. If you look on eBay, go type in G.I. Joe 266 in eBay right now. And, or no, Don't click off this show, though. I mean, if you're watching it on the computer, if you're watching it on the TV, look on your phone. If not, wait till the show's over. You will see 10% of what you will see available of any of the other major leases. Even, even you want to talk about even look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 97. You will see 10%. You're not talking about a lot. You'll see uh, those big, you know those big dealers who have like 30 copies of cover A of every book listed, Brian? You'll see at most seven or eight of the cover here. This book will not last. And we've talked about this before. When, when IDW does an extra incentive for a book, and that's what you're getting here. Usually you get with G.I. Joe a one in 10 incentive, and that's that book that's the third from the left. That's that one in 10 incentive where you see the two snake eyes is face off. You got a one in 15. That's what that book on the far right is. Um, and that is not typical of G.I. Joe releases. And every time they've done that, they're letting you know this is going to be big. And they have put out in the solicit this is going to be a huge story. They said every G.I. Joe in the history of G.I. Joe's will appear in this storyline. So you're going to get a very thorough story. And then Talking about spec and talking about how people like to put sets together, maybe the sleeper cover of all covers is that second cover from the left. It's considered an action figure variant, although it doesn't look like what we typically expect from action figures because it's going to be a connecting set throughout this entire run of, of books. And I want to say that this series is like nine books or something like that. So this is going to be a big connecting set. And it features sort of, it's supposed to look like the loose action figures and the loose vehicles um, that we all collected, those Kenner, um, you know, 3.75 inch G.I. Joe figures. Um, I think long term, that, that cover is going to be tough to find. Um, and it reminds me of when they released the traditional action figure variants, again, around two, that 220s through 240s area. Those were dollar bin fodder in Midtown sales and in TFAW sales. Go look those up right now. Go look and see what those are going for, $10, $15 each. So G.I. Joe collectors, they love their action figures. They love their connecting sets. Um, I think this is a long-term winner. If it's not for you, it's not for you. But the point of the AKA Mr. Bolo long-term play of the week is for me to try to give you game on something that you may not be looking at. There's going to be a million people talking absolute carnage. There's a million people talking once in the future at this point. There's a million people talking about Ninja Turtles now. You know, but we've been talking about this G.I. Joe story. Um, my man Brian, who's not a, typically a G.I. Joe guy, uh, immediately hit me up when he read this solicitation, didn't you, Brian? Yeah, well... Like I said, in previews, one, because the cover A was gorgeous. And then two, it's like, hey, there's a 1 in 15 variant for this. And I know Jack was a G.I. Joe. He reads the comic. I Me, mean, I was an action figure guy, collected him as a kid and loved the cartoon, but wasn't a big G.I. Joe comic reader. So that's where I reached out to Jack said, what's going on with this? And he kind of filled me in. And that from that point on, I was like, all right, I'm on board for this arc at least. Yeah, and that's, and that's what I would suggest is... If you've ever considered jumping on a G.I. Joe arc, do it with this one. Give this one a try. Um, I find it very hard to believe you're going to lose long-term on this one. And again, that's why it's the long-term play. It's not the immediate flip. You're not going to make money in the short term on this. I will say that that 1 in 15 variant is sold out most most places. The cheap copies are starting to dry up off of eBay. I expect you to be able to turn a profit on that book by next week, no less. Um, I think 1 in 10 is probably next. You're probably going to get those incentives profitable first. Um, the A and B, I think, are going to be profitable in sets. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that this is a good one. And again, I'll be straight, blunt, and honest with you. I read issue, this issue, and it was a little slow. It, not necessarily slow. It just didn't get into action yet. It was almost like a... Um, 
almost like a prologue, almost, uh, you know, setting the mood for what's going to happen. So I was disappointed because I was hoping for some big time major G.I. Joe action, but we're going to get there. So uh, we definitely get an idea of what Cobra is trying to do. And um, we get an idea of, of what is kind of coming down the pike. And that's going to bring us to the conclusion of Jack's long-term play for this week. But before we end this show, as always, we like to kind of let you know what's coming up on the channel. So we all know Wednesdays we have the Hot and Cold Show. Sundays I have my weekly picks. Thursday night we have the Bolo Show. Jack's actually working on some back-issue Bolo videos right now, correct? Also, Jack? Absolutely. I've got 13 episodes scripted, uh, working on two more, and we are ready to start shooting and dropping them on the channel. Right. But we also have some other content that we're kind of working on. Do you want to talk about that with the with the channel? I do, and it really plays into what we just talked about. Um, we've been talking in recent weeks um, on this channel, and Brian caught some flack for it, haven't we? Um, <laughs> A little bit. A little uh, bit. We, We've been talking about pre-FOC spec, and if you're not familiar with FOC, I've used it about ten times on the channel, so I apologize on, on this episode, so I apologize. But it's a final order cutoff. It is the last day in which you can get in contact with your LCS, where they can get that order, and it's supposed to be guaranteed. We learn once in future, albeit there's some allocations that sometimes do occur, but typically that is the last opportunity you have to lock your order in. And debuting tomorrow night, we will have a as-yet-untitled pre-FOC show. And it will be a show where we are going to talk about the, in our eyes, the most noteworthy of all of the books appearing on the FOC list. Now, every Monday, new books FOC. And by talking about them on Friday, we are going to give you Friday night, Saturday, Sunday into Monday. I think the FOC is due in by like 10 p.m. or midnight. It's on 10 p.m. Eastern, Monday right. nights. Monday nights. So we are giving you a three-day run to be able to get in contact with your LCS and be able to lock in orders on whatever it is you may like. Um, and again, there's been a lot of flack about F FOC spec. We're not telling you what to buy. We're not telling you... Um, you know, we're not trying to blow print runs up or anything like people want to talk about. Again, if if we're that good, then publishers need to hire us. Diamond needs to hire us because, you know, if that's really what's going down. It's not that the point. The point is we want to be able to talk about books early. We want you guys to be able to get in on these things on the ground floor. If you're buying pre-FOC and you're pre-ordering, you're also usually getting your largest discount percentage. Um, both of our sponsors here on the channel, uh, Slabbed Heroes and um, and Frankie's take FOC orders. Um, I, I don't want to quote those guys pricing in, in and of themselves, but there's plenty of other re online retailers that take FOC orders. A lot of times you're getting deep, deep discounts to go ahead and put those FOC orders in. Even if you're not getting discounts from your, from your um, online retailer or LCS, Usually you can lock in those those uh, pre-orders, and we want to give you that heads up. And we want to, again, start the conversation early. So we are really excited for this show. Um, we are gonna, It's going to be replacing our typical Friday night programming. It's our original content, which is what we like to do on this channel. And we are excited to do it, and uh, that's really what it's all about is we want to do – we want to do content on this channel that we are excited about. Um, so, you know, people are going to say that it's for this nefarious reason or that nefarious reason, but the reality of the situation is we put it out to Simpleman's Comics family. Do you guys want to talk about this? And there was a resounding yes. So that's what's important to us is what does our community want? Not, not what do other people think. So, um, because of that reason, we're excited to bring you that show starting tomorrow. Right. Another thing that came up the idea is a lot of this content we're always presenting to you guys is reactive. We're reacting to the market, reacting to trends, reacting to this is the content that's going to be proactive. That's going to give you, hey, this is the stuff that we see or the stuff that we like that you can get on before it gets to that point where we're talking about it and the reactive content. So it gives us the full cycle of content, full cycle of titles. That way we're covering all bases, providing as much information as possible to you guys, the audience. A lot of people... It's going to be, if it's 
if everyone enjoyed it, it wouldn't be worth talking about. So we like that type of content where it's going to have split type of audience. Some people are going to like it. Some people aren't going to like it. But this is the way it's going to be. And we're happy to bring this content to you guys because we all enjoy comics. And it's about integrity. And it's about community on this channel. And we can't wait to bring this new video to you guys. And we feel like now we're giving you the entire spec cycle, right? We're talking about books pre-FOC. That's the, your earliest point to order them. Then with Brian's weekly picks, we're talking about books a few days before they come out, getting you ready to do that Wednesday morning. Then with the Bolo Show, we're talking about what just came out, what maybe you should be selling, what you should be maybe going back to your LCS to try to buy. Then we've got the back issue Bolo Show coming, where it's going to give you a look ahead at maybe some back issues you need to be grabbing from the back issue bin. And then the Hot and Cold Show, which is telling you what is hot, what is moving, and what is not. And we are giving you the entire spec cycle, the entire spectrum of all things uh, comic books, whether we're talking new comic books or back issues, and all new comic books eventually become back issues. So we're excited to be able to do that and feel like we're covering all of our bases, as Brian said. So um, let us know again in the comments how whether you're excited about it, if you're as excited as we are, because we are definitely amped up to talk about this. Right. I will let you know there's one other window where you can order even before pre-FOC, and that's when previews comes out, and that's a full two months ahead. Pre-FOC is kind of like we're saying is that last final, hey, the order's cutting off, you need to get your order in before you're hoping that the LCS has ordered an extra copy for you to get. But Right. As soon as that previews comes out, that pre-FOC window has now begun, that, that before final order. But we were going to talk about it at kind of like that last second. It's like 23 days before an issue is released, I believe, right? Yes, correct, correct. You have to basically 23 days uh, to get that order in. We're going to hit you with that last second reminder like, hey, maybe you've been thinking about this issue and you, and you haven't put that order in. Now is the time. Now, we're not going to discuss every single issue that's pre-FOC. We're going to pick our favorites, but we will provide a list of the pre-FOC books that we have which will be provided on simplemanscomics.com for you guys to look at. Yes, yes. So there will be an article version. Check out simplemanscomics.com to get that. That is exclusive to simplemanscomics.com. And with that being said, that's going to conclude our show for tonight. Remember, click that like button. And if you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe so you get notified of future videos. I'm Brian Wood. And I am Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. And buy what you like, guys. That way you'll always be happy with your collection. And with that... We'll say good night.